Hi, my name is John Craig, and I'm pleased that you have chosen to view this seminar on the Vietnam War. I'm chairman of the Lancaster County Society for Historical Preservation in Lancaster, South Carolina, which owns and operates the historic 1862 Lancaster Cultural Arts Center in Lancaster, just south of Charlotte, North Carolina. The center is home to monthly continuing education se uh, seminars like this one on a variety of topics. We also sponsor almost 30 concerts in our acoustically acclaimed historic performance hall, ranging from classical to jazz to blues and country and beyond. You can find out more about these on our website, lcshp.org. Again, that's lcshp.org. Turning to the Vietnam War, this is a topic that 30 years after the close of the conflict for Americans still stirs strong emotions and memories. The Vietnam Peace Accords liberating American POWs and concluding American military involvement was, were signed on January the 17th, 1973. So this is indeed the 50th anniversary year of a war that tore our country apart and whose, con whose consequences reverberate in our society to this day. Arguably, the polarization that currently dominates our country began with the Vietnam War. I expect that there is a good number of Vietnam vets watching this, number, this video, and I want to say thanks to each of you for your service, and to the vets of other American wars who are watching this video. You may be curious why the map in slide two is necessary. I'm sure everyone here knows where Vietnam is, but one of the reasons I decided to do this seminar is that several years ago, I discovered that some do not. I was getting my hair cut in a local barber shop and got into a conversation with the 50-something owner about service in Vietnam. He interrupted me to ask, Vietnam, now where is that? Latin America? I thought to myself, here we are talking about one of the seminal events in 20th century American history, and people already know next to no, nothing about it. We must do something about this. Now, I've outlined in slide three the ground I'll be covering today. We'll begin with first the importance of geography and demography in Vietnam's history, then highlight our tortured his that tortured history up to Vietnam's colonialization by the French in 1858. We'll next talk about how the French set themselves up for the nationalist and communist insurrections that led to the French Indochina War from 1945 to 1954, the first Vietnam War. That will bring us to highlights of the American Vietnam War from 1960 to 1973. This tragedy has been well documented by the likes of Ken Burns and others, and here I will focus on a side of the war not so well known, the U.S. effort to win the hearts and minds of the people of Vietnam and turn the war back over to the Vietnamese. This is a part of the war in which I was involved as a foreign service officer, and I will share your, some personal reflections on it. I'll conclude with insights on what Vietnam is like today and suggest lessons to be drawn from this episode in American history that I think are highly relevant now. So let's begin in slide four with the importance of geography and demography in Vietnam's history. It's been said that geography is destiny. That's certainly the case with Vietnam. As you can see in slide five, Vietnam is S-shaped, or since it's a maritime country, I prefer to say it's seahorse-shaped. The country is over 1,000 miles long, 20% longer, longer than California's 840 miles, and 80% longer than South Carolina's 210. The country is only 31 miles wide at its narrowest point, and 210 to 340 miles at its widest points, in comparison to South Carolina's 273 miles. In landmass, Vietnam is just four times the size of South Carolina and four-fifths the size of California, just a little bit smaller than the size of New Mexico. A major geographical feature that essentially made Vietnam two countries historically were the two large near-sea level river deltas, one in the north, the Red River Delta, and one in the south, the Mekong River Delta. Most of the population lives in these two deltas, some 800 miles apart, two countries. The country's climate varies from tropical in the south to temperate in the north. 
Those differences contributed to important differences in the temperaments of the regional populations. To grossly generalize, the North Vietnamese are typically assertive, many would say aggressive, while the South Vietnamese are more laid back. And in the pre-air conditioning era, the French regarded them as lackadaisical and indolent. The North Vietnamese are simply more warlike than are the South Vietnamese, in part because of the long history of combating the Chinese, a story which we will come to later. You will observe that in between the two deltas, there's a long coastal plain, and on the other side, the western side, rugged highlands on the western side, the highlands, highlands being home to non-Vietnamese mountain people. A final feature of Vietnam's geography that has been crucial in shaping its history are the porous tropical forest and mountain borders with China at the top of the map on the left, Laos, the elongated country on the left, and Cambodia, the sort of South Carolina-shaped country at the bottom of, on the left. This geographic feature has historically made Vietnam easily invadable along the northern and western borders, and no less important, provided sanctuary and supply routes for rebellious Vietnamese. Now, demography can be, and often is, destiny, just as much as geography. And we turn to this in slide six. Here, a key thing to know is that in modern times, Vietnam has had a very high population growth rate, even in wartime. During the American War, Vietnam's total population grew from 40 million to 50 million, while losing two to three million in deaths. In 2022, it reached 100 million, compared to California's 39 million. This young population, when ideologically motivated, produced an inexhaustible supply of Civil War combatants. More on demography in slide seven. Vietnam has a long history of ethnic strife. There are 54 ethnic groups in Vietnam. The Vietnamese make up 85% of the population, shown in light green on the map, but Cambodian in dark green, mountain and lowland tribes, yellow and blue colors, and Chinese are also significant minorities as are our people called Cham, that C-H-A-M, left behind from an, an ancient vanquished empire, colored in orange. The presence of these groups worked against Vietnam's unity throughout its history. Language differences have been, further, been a further strike against national unity in Vietnam's history. As you see on the right, there are three major Vietnamese dialects, North, Central, and South, with many variations within each dialect. For example, while serving in Vietnam, I spoke the southern di dialect of Vietnamese, but could not understand the central and northern dialects, and certainly could not speak them intelligibly. Yet another divisive demographic force in Vietnam's 20th century in political and military history was the outsized role played by religious minorities. As shown in slide eight, some 80% of the population is animist or quasi-Confucian, that is, believing in supernatural powers and practicing what we Westerners call ancestor worship. But the small French-identified Catholic elite, which is 67% of the population, dominated the government of South Vietnam. And martyrs from the Buddhist population, about 9% of the total, drew international sympathy during the international Vietnam War. Additionally, the armed Hoa Hau and Cao Dai sects were essentially governments within the government in, in the South during the war. And Saigon's Binh Xuân Mafia added to national, factional turmoil in the 20th century. I'm showing here in slide nine, the Khao Dai Temple in Tay Ninh City, near the border with Cambodia in 2020. If you ever travel to Vietnam, this site is well worth a visit. Khao Daoism combines Vietnamese folk religion with Confucianism, Buddhism, and Catholicism. Interesting, interestingly, its saints include the Buddha, Confucius, Jesus Christ, the Mother Mary, Victor Hugo, Sun Yat-sen, and others. It's a syncretic religion. We turn in slide 10 and then slide 11 to Vietnam's history, which can best be understood as a 2,000 years old march to the south, march to the south, mark, marked by virtually continuous warfare. It's key to understand, and you'll observe in slide 11, that for more than half of its history, Vietnam, quotes, consisted of just the Red River Delta in the north the capital of which is Hanoi. But the conquering push southward was constant, albeit with long stop and then go periods. At the time of the Dark Ages in Western Europe, Vietnam was just the Red River Delta, plus its surrounding highlands. Not until the Western Middle Ages did it reach what is now central Vietnam, 
with the imperial capital city of Wei. And the Vietnamese did not colonize the Mekong River Delta in the south until the time of our French and Indian War and the American Revolution in the mid to late 1700s. There's an important overlay to this history because you see in slide 12, Vietnam was, was ruled by China for a thousand years from 111 in the, before the Christian era to 905 AD. And after the Chinese were thrown out in, in 905, the Mongols returned 300 years later in the late 1200s for yet another invasion and occupation. As exemplified by the Sino-Vietnamese War in 1979, the two countries will always remain fundamentally at odds, a fact that we Americans were slow to appreciate. <coughs> if China was a northern aggressor in Vietnam's history, the Vietnamese themselves were aggressors against kingdoms and even empires in their push southward. As you can see in slide 13, they get engaged in repeated wars with the Champa and Khmer, that is Cambodian kingdoms, from 800 AD to 1660 AD, seizing central Vietnam from the Champas and the Mekong Delta from the Cambodians, the Khmers. In this map, the original Vietnam is in blue. The Champa kingdom they had wiped out by the 1600s is in yellow, and the Cambodian or Khmer Empire is rose-colored. The enmity between the Vietnamese and Cam Cambodians continues as demonstrated by their 1975 to 1989 war, when Cambodia first tried to take the Mekong Delta from the triumphant North Vietnamese, and then the latter successfully invaded Cambodia, taking out the genocidally murderous Paul Poi regime. This 14-year war did not conclude until 1989. Now, while all the warfare was going on, all this warfare was going on to advance the push southward to the Mekong Delta, the Vietnamese were fighting amongst themselves as to which faction would rule the country. As you see in slide 14, from 939 AD to 1862, there were 10 monarchical dy dynasties. That amounts to a dynastic upheaval, or on average, every 92 years. Even within dynamic, dynastic periods, there were frequent uprisings and regal overthrows. There were periodic north-south partitionings of the country between dynasties, plus other partitionings. No monarch until 1802 ruled all of what is now Vietnam. And as we shall see, that quote's unification, such as it was, lasted for only 60 years, when the French took over in 1862. In truth, throughout Vietnam's 2,000-year monarchical history, the rulers had only loose control of the countryside. Thus, the Vietnamese aphorism the sovereign's laws end at the village gate. <clears throat> Whatever was going on at the top, the village elders were left to manage matters locally. Now in slides 15 and 16, we come to the French imperialists in Vietnam. My apologies to the French, French speakers in our audience, because I'm not going to be very kind about France's conduct and legacy in Vietnam. In my defense, I'll say that historians are virtually unanimous in this judgment. As we see in slide 16, the French involvement in Vietnam began with the arrival of Catholic missionaries in 1600s. French seafaring merchants followed in the 1700s, and the missionaries were successful in building a very sizable Vietnamese Catholic population. But it was Emperor Napoleon III whose forces seized control of Vietnam in 1858 to 67 as part of France's Indochina Empire. That empire included what are now Vietnam, Cambodia, which is rose-colored in the map, and Laos in green. Reinforcing Vietnam's history of disunity, the French did not rule the, the country as one state, but as three separate entities. Tonkin in the north, tan-colored on the map, Annam in the midsection, mustard-colored, and Cochin, China, aqua-colored in the south. That's Saigon and the Mekong River Delta. You don't have to remember these names. The point is that not even the Imperial French unified Vietnam to be ruled as one country. As explained by the historian John McAllister in slide 17, a person I knew as a graduate student at Princeton in 1960-68, other, the other great failure of the French in Vietnam was that their colonial administrators, French and mainly Catholic Vietnamese officials, supplanted traditional local, local government in eliminating almost indigenous political activity the French left no legitimate channels for political expression. The consequence was that when French strength wavered during War II in the 1940s, pent-up Vietnamese political energies erupted in a revolution that no amount of French force could subdue. 
In slide 18, <coughs> I highlight what was happening to French Vietnam up to the end of World War II. It was in this period that the embers of the later Vietnam Wars were lit. Parties of nationalist Vietnamese began to form in the 1910s, pushing the French for independence. Insurrections began in the 1920s, but the French refused to grant the country any measure of independence and would not even train a loyal army of Vietnamese to help fight the insurgents. Paris educated Ho Chi Minh, a founder of the Communist Party of Vietnam, was trained in the Soviet Union in the 1920s and then served as a Comintern agent in China and Vietnam. Incidentally, Ho Chi Minh tried to meet with American President Woodrow Wilson at the, at the 1919 Versailles Peace Conference in Paris following World War I, but was rebuffed. The Japanese seized Vietnam in 1940 as they expanded their empire southward during World War II, but they left the government in the hands of the collaborating Vichy French regime. During World War II, the U.S. aided both the Vietnamese nationalists and communist insurgents, including Ho Chi Minh against the Japanese. We gave support to Ho Chi Minh during World War II. Upon Japan's 1945 defeat <coughs> by Allied uh, agreement, the north of Vietnam was temporarily occupied by the nationalist Chinese and the south of Vietnam by the British. The Japanese had thrown the French out in the final months of World War II. And on September 2, 1945, Ho Chi Minh proclaimed the independent Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh beat competing nationally parties to the punch, and there's little doubt among historians that had Vietnam-wide elections been held at this time, the country would have been united under communist leadership. But that was not to be. And that brings us to the French Indochina, or First Vietnam War, 1945 to 54, in slides 19 and 20. As I note in slide 20, the French were allowed to return in Vietnam in late 1945 by the Truman administration. American policy was officially anti-colonial, but the bankrupt French needed imperial prestige to regain their status as a great power, and the U.S. needed French participation in NATO. And thus a deal, or bargain with the devil, was struck. Ho Chi Minh responded immediately by launching an insurgency against the French and their puppet Vietnamese government with the support of Mao's communists in, Chi communists in China, who would soon rule that country. There followed a losing nine-year battle for the French, who even with substantial U.S. military aid could not win. As you see in the map in slide 20, by 1950, two-thirds of the country was controlled by the communists, and much of the rest was under guerrilla warfare attack. The First Vietnam War culminated in catastrophe with the 1954 French defeat in the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, in the highlands, near the Laos-China border. The two photographs in slide 21 show how the communists won the pivotal battle by moving troops, supplies, and artillery through mountainous jungle by hand and bicycles. As an aside, I remember well as a 10-year-old seeing the one and a half inch headline, Dien Bin Phu Falls on the front page of the Charlotte Observer at my aunt's breakfast table. That was the first time that Vietnam registered in my memory and little did I know at the time what a significant role the country would play in my life. The Dien Bien Phu defeat forced the French to the 1954 Geneva Peace Conference, where, as summarized in slide 22, the Accords partitioned Vietnam into north and south halves at the 17th parallel, with the communists ruling the north and the French puppet emperor Bao Dai ruling, quotes, the south. The peace accords mandated a ceasefire with national elections to be held in 1956 and the country united. As you saw in slide 20, it's highly likely that the communists would have won the 1956 elections had they been held, but they never were. Indeed, under U.S. sponsorship, Ngo Dinh Diem, a reclusive autocratic Catholic Mandarin, emerged as head of the South's government. The next two slides are a tale of two countries how the development of North and South Vietnam diverged between 1954 and 1964. Slide 23 summarizes how North Vietnam developed as a unified communist state. The communist regime in the North consolidated power based on the revolutionary ideology under Ho, Ho Chi Minh. Expecting persecution or slaughter, 60% of the North's Catholics, more than a million people, fled to South Vietnam. The communists embarked upon an ambitious socialist industrialization program and, quotes, land reform, which turned into collectivized agriculture. This was accomplished with major Soviet and communist China aid, 
which also financed the successful buildup of Army and guerrilla warfare forces. As a result, by the early 1960s, the North had, had, had resumed infiltration of South Vietnam via the Ho Chi Minh Trail in, in Laos and, and Cambodia, supporting South Vietnamese communist insurgents. Slide 24 summarizes the very different story in the South between 1954 and 1964, where South Vietnam failed to become a functioning nation and U.S. involvement escalated. The heart of the problem was that South Vietnam did not develop politically. Ngo Dinh Zim was incompetent and created no political base, becoming dictatorial. Corruption in the government was rampant, as were nepotism and cronyism. The religious and ethnic sects we discussed earlier thought Zim, as did the Saigon Mafia, and essentially created their own mini-states within the country. The South Vietnamese army was extremely slow to develop and never became battle-strong, despite lots of U.S. aid. Various strategies to protect the population failed, compounding lack of popular support for Zim's government and strengthening the communists. The result was the steady progress of the Viet Cong invasion insurgencies that you see in the map on the right, where, at, at the, where the dark and shaded areas indicate communist control and its spread. In this context, the number of U.S. advisors and U.S. aid grew continuously. This brings us in slides 25 and 26 to why the U.S. in 1964 escalated its role in Vietnam from that of aid supplier and advisor to full-scale full scale combatant. In hindsight, one would think that, given the strife-torn history of Vietnam, the sensible thing would have been to say, no way are we getting pulled into this mess. But no one did until it was too late, and here are some explanations why. Most importantly, Full-scale U.S. military engagement in Vietnam was a product of the 1945-89 Cold War. In the 1960s, we were still re reeling from the loss of China and, and near loss of Korea following World War II. The recently declassified 1960s, 1960s map on the right shows the official China containment policy of the U.S., of which Vietnam was one of four fronts. President Eisenhower was convinced that the fall of Vietnam would trigger subsequent communist takeovers of Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and even India, the domino theory, which he made famous. Beyond this, Cold War outlook, a specific event that cast a die for the U.S. Vietnam War, was the U.S. sanctioned coup against President Diem in 1963, which resulted in his assassination. With the removal of the leader we had sponsored, we became responsible for Vietnam, and the war became an American war. Other con contributing factors were these. Ignorance of a w and, and a will not to know Vietnam's history and culture at the highest levels. I can testify to this, as in none of my one-year training in 1968, prior to being sent as an advisor to Vietnam in 1969, was I taught anything about the history and culture we've just covered. And the academicians and reporters who did know these things were brushed aside by policymakers. Adding to this, the hubris of the Kennedy Great Society era. America was an extremely confident nation in the early 1960s. And President Kennedy, in his inaugural speech, famously said, We shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to assure the, the survival and the success of liberty. Bold and noble words, but fraught with peril, if cost and possible unforeseen and un unintended consequences are not considered. The defense of liberty must be a two-way street. Those whom we seek to aid must be as committed to the cause as are we to it. And finally, there was a the habit of all bureaucracies to not admit and learn from mistake and instead to double down. This brings us to the milestones in 1964-73 of the American Vietnam War, which I've laid out in slide 27. I'll run through these quickly as many of you live this history, and I want to get to the less well-known battle to win the hearts and minds of the South Vietnamese people. Following the 1964 Congressional, uh, Congressional Gulf of Tonkin War Resolution, President Lyndon Johnson steadily upped the number of Americans fighting in Vietnam at General Westmoreland's request. The number peaked at, in 1968 at almost 540,000. Westmoreland always said, with each request for 100,000 more troops, that will do it. 
but this never proved to be the case. And with the disastrous Viet Cong Tet Offensive in January 1968, and vehement and violent anti-war protest at home, Johnson had to say, no more. You will note in the graph on the right that only South Korea, and much less so as Thailand, provided a significant number of soldiers as allies in the war. And most of the Koreans were essentially mercenaries. The failure of our allies in surrounding countries to step up to South Vietnam's defense was eventually seen, but too late, as an indicator of how much credence they placed in Eisenhower's domino theory. The anti-war protests throughout the U.S. ultimately forced Johnson out of office, and Richard Nixon was then elected president with the promise to end the Vietnam War. Regrettably, in my view, Nixon and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger instead prolonged the war for another five years, the strategy being to withdraw U.S. troops gradually turn the war back over to the Army of Vietnam, backed by U.S. military and civilian advisors. As we shall see shortly, the strategy was two-pronged, Vietnam, Vietnamize the military war and, quotes, pacify the population, winning their hearts and minds, as the slogan went, through government reforms, economic development, and security against terrorism and guerrilla warfare. The Nixon strategy included intensified bombings of the North in the 1970 U.S. invasion of Cambodia. The U.S.-Vietnam War ended with the January 1973 Paris Peace Accords, which brought our POWs home. By this time, Nixon was out of office because of Watergate, with the presidency severely weakened unable and unable to ensure the continued aid to the government of South Vietnam that had been promised as part of keeping the South at the peace talks table. Having had it with the issue, Congress cut off aid to South Vietnam in 1974, a move that contributed majorly to its fall to the North in 1975. The South Vietnamese Army simply proved no match to the main force North Vietnamese Army once it was clear it could, could cross the 17th parallel with no fear of renewed U.S. engagement. Thus, in the spring of 1975, after 2,000 years of disunity, Vietnam was united as one country under communist rule. We come in slide 28 to the other war that I referred to earlier, pacification, winning the hearts and minds of the people of South Vietnam. With battlefield stalemate and U.S. military withdrawal, the U.S. policy from 1969 on became Vietnamization, turning the fighting back over to the South Vietnamese army and local forces and building up responsible government security and economic strength at the local level. That is what we now call nation building, which we tried again in Iraq and Afghanistan recently. You see in the map that South Vietnam was divided into four military regions, 46 provinces, and hundreds of districts, think counties, within provinces. Saigon appointed province chiefs were Vietnamese army colonels, and Saigon appointed district chiefs were majors. U.S. advisory teams were stationed in the most populated districts to encourage effective military leadership, responsible government, and economic development by province and district chiefs. Approximately 2,500 military and foreign service officers served on these teams at any one time. Their job was to motivate the local forces to fight the VC guerrillas, to protect the local population, and to promote good local government, provide government services, fight corruption, encourage real elections, and aid refugees, supply aid to build bridges, schools, health, clinics, and so forth. That's the general picture of the pacification program. So let's turn now to a case study, Hung Mi District in Quinoa Province between 1969 and 71. This is where I first served. In slide 29, you see circled in red the location of Hung Mi District in the Mekong River Delta. It was on an island between branches of the Mekong River. While just 55 miles from Saigon, it had just as well been 500 miles distant and it was accessible only by helicopter gunships. There were no bridges across the Mekong River at the time, and most canal bridges had been destroyed, blown up. The river ferry was controlled by the VC, and all roads were puckered with landmines. Hung Mi, like all Mekong River Delta districts, was a land of vast rice paddies, innumerable tree-lined tree canals, and dirt, mud, roads, and trails. Most of the rice paddies were still on large plantations owned by absentee French, Chinese, and elite Vietnamese families. The only much-needed land reform that had occurred was in D.C.-controlled areas. In 1969 to 71, 
There were four villages with 60 hamlets with a population of between 40 and 50,000 50, 50, in the district. In area, Hung Mi District was 120 square miles compared to Lancaster County's 550 square miles. Now, as described in slide 30, Hung Mi District and Quinoa Province, in which it is located, were hotly contested throughout the French and American Vietnamese War, wars. In early 1960, in an attack generally considered to be the start of the Second Vietnam War, the Communists took control of most of Hung Mi District. The secretary of the Quinoa Communist Party, Madame Nguyen T. Den, led the all-female, quotes, long hair army, end of quotes, in this uprising, and she rose in rank eventually to become a Viet Cong Major General. The map on the right shows the major Tet Offensive attacks by the Viet Cong in 1968. Quinoa Province, its capital, Ben Tre, was famously the city we had to destroy to save during the 1968 Tet Offensive. I refer to the eye-opening moment in newspapers across the U.S. when a U.S. Army officer tried to explain the devastation that we had wrecked on Ben Tre. Most villages in northern Hung Mi District had been destroyed by main force un units in the post Tet 1968 period, and the VC still controls 75 percent of Hung Mi District in 1969-71, the period I was there. The importance of Hung Mi District during the war is emphasized in, in slide 31, where you see that the district was a major secret terminus for the maritime Ho Chi Minh Trail, the red lines on the right. Hung Mi Fort, where I was based, was only about eight miles upriver from the terminus, and yet we knew nothing about it during the war. While the overland Ho Chi Minh Trail through the Laos and Cambodia, the red lines on the left in the map, was famous in wartime media coverage, the Maritime Trail was seldom mentioned. But today there is the large monument at the isolated Hung Mi Terminus shown in, in slide 32, in which I was photographed in, in 2020. You see on the right one of the many canals for transporting weaponry arriving via the Maritime Ho Chi Minh Trail. This picture was taken in 1969. In Hung Mi, as throughout South Vietnam, the Viet Cong recruited the, the people with promises of land reform, socialism, and united self-government without foreign intervention, plus intimidation and terrorism. The vast rice paddies worked by hand and water buffaloes by landless peasants in Hung Mi District, pictured on the right in slide 33, illustrate the psychological advantage that the communists had in the winning the people to their side. And the blasted French plantation house on the left shows the damage they routinely wrecked to intimidate. Village and hamlet chiefs loyal to the side of the South were routinely assassinated. So what did I and my advisory team do in Hung Mi District in 1969-71? As I summarized in slide 34, ours was an eight-man team, an army major and a Vietnamese-speaking foreign service officer, that was me, led the team. In addition, we had an army captain, a lieutenant as counterterrorism advisor, a medic, sergeant, two other sergeant, and a corporal. There was substantial turnover in this team as we were targets for the VC. Someone's number came up about every six weeks. Lots of heartbreak. Our mission was a direct threat to the VC. We were to bolster and monitor the direct district chief's performance, encourage proactive military and government activity, report corruption and poor performance. Yet the local forces think armed National Guard to fight the VC. These troops did not really want to engage the VC, and we had to make them do so. We did that by going out on our own, and they had to come with us. Conduct air medevacs, often under fire, by both military and civilian populations. Gather intelligence on VC infiltration. Boost the morale of village and hamlet chiefs through regular on-site meetings and overnight stays in threatened villages. And direct U.S. aid for construction of bridges, roads, schools, medical schools. Resettle and provide aid to refugees and monitor elections, which unfortunately were largely fake. With bridges cut, roads mined, and VC control canals, we were supplied daily by helicopter gunships, which also supported our military operations and medevacs. There's one in slide 35 coming into Fort Hung Mi in 1969. The picture on the right shows how the monsoon season made roads easy minefields, mud. And in slide, the next slide, you will see one of the small outposts we had, 
had at strategic locations around Hung Mi District, manned by local forces whose loyalties were not reliable. These outposts were often overrun by the VC, and Hung Mi Fort itself, which had regular nighttime mortar attacks, was almost overrun twice in 1969-71. Major setbacks occurred in May of 1970 when Nixon's invasion of Cambodia stripped the Mekong Delta of main force units and the VC aggressively infiltrated our district. It was at that time that my captain and I were taken out with a command detonated landmine. After recovering from injuries at Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines, I was sent back for another year of service in a district, uh, to a district in Sop Training Province further south. When I left Vietnam after two years of wartime service there, speaking the language and all but living as a Vietnamese, I was convinced that there was no way that we or the South Vietnamese could win that war. Our side, the South Vietnamese, simply lacked the ideological further and the coherence as a nation that the North Vietnamese had. What I did not understand at the time was that all of Vietnam's 2,000 year history further was on the side of the North Vietnamese. The Vietnam War was just the end game of a 2,000 year struggle. The fall of Saigon in 1975 proved that assessment to be correct. All of this was 50 years ago. So let's turn to what Vietnam is like today. My partner and I decided to do a 50 year later, a later return visit to, to my areas of service in 2020. And it was quite an experience. As pictured in slide 37, Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, but they still really call it Saigon, today is a modern metropolis. We went down to Hung Mi District, where we found the town to be thriving, with a paved highway and a magnificent bridge spanning the wide Mekong River. The photograph on the left, slide 38, is just a quarter mile distant from the site of the mining incident in which I and my captain were almost killed in 1970. Fort Hung, Hung Mi was gone, but remarkably, what does remain is a small hooch that you see on the right in which the U.S. military teams lived. A little family lives there now, and amazingly, their eating table is the very same table at which my team worked at and ate at. Ate at. We visited two days in a row and were welcomed. The 40-foot cast bronze statue of Ho Chi Minh that you see in slide 39 presiding over Saigon's main square is surrounded by Prada, Coach, Gucci, Ferragama, and other capitalist boutiques. We concluded our visit thinking about the ironic end result, 50 years later, of a 30-year war in which 2.3 million Vietnamese died, and 58,000 American soldiers died, and almost 100,000 French soldiers were killed in action. A united country with a nominally communist dictatorship atop a thriving capitalist economy with Vietnam increasingly a potential ally of the U.S. in containing China. Much has been written over the years about lessons for the U.S. to be learned from the Vietnam War, and not all agree, but I suggest that most students of the experience would endorse those enumerated in slide, slide 40 regarding when the U.S. should get involved in overseas land wars. I'll present these as questions. The first question to be asked is whether the U.S. has a strategic stake in the country. That was not true of Vietnam. Indeed, President Roosevelt's Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, had to ask where Vietnam was located. And in one of the many hearings in Congress during the Vietnam War, one expert said famously, yes, the situation is desperate, but it's not serious. Secondly, do we have a thorough understanding of the history and culture of the country we seek to aid? Thirdly, is the country to whose aid we are sending troops a true nation? Is its government functional? Does it have popular support? Fourth, whether the objective is winning the war or containing the enemy, are we willing and able to commit the resources that the objective requires? Fifth, can we explain to the American public why we must engage in this war and what our objectives are? Sixth, can we limit the time frame of American engagement? The American public has limited tolerance for long duration wars. Seventh, do we have a plan to follow up on military successes? In Vietnam, there were periods in the mid 1960s when we made some military progress against the Viet communists, but we had no workable plan for developing a functional government backed by the people. 
The same was true in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. I'm going to conclude this look back on the Vietnam War with two quotations. The one on the left in slide 41 reinforces the importance of knowing what you're getting into when considering an overseas military adventure. Leslie Galb, study director of the 2018 Pentagon Papers and later Assistant U.S. Secretary of State, concludes as follows. You know, we get involved in these wars and we don't know a damn thing about those countries, the culture, the history, the politics, people on top and even down below. And my heavens, these are not wars like World War II and World War I where you have battalions fighting battalions. These are wars that depend on knowledge of who the people are, what the culture is like, and we jumped into, the, jumped into them without knowing. From an entirely different perspective, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger reflects as follows. On Vietnam, I think of the dedicated men and women, soldiers and foreign service officers, who had struggled and suffered there and of our Vietnamese associates, condemned to face an uncertain but surely painful fate. These Americans had honestly believed that they were de defending the cause of freedom against a brutal enemy in treacherous jungles and distant rice paddies. Vilified by the media, assailed in Congress, and ridiculed by the protest movement, they had sustained America's idealistic tradition, risking their lives and expending their youth on a struggle that American leadership groups had initiated, then abandoned, and finally disdained. I close with this quotation because for many Vietnam vets, the worst part of the war was how they were treated upon returning home. It was a very hostile or indifferent environment, lacking in the support that American vets had received in earlier wars. That's one lesson that I think we learned from that war. And I thank God every time when waiting to board a plane nowadays, I hear the announcement, military service people are free to board with first class first. Thank you for your interest in this episode in American history and for being willing to consider one set of reflections on it. Feel free to contact me at jecraig66 at gmail.com if you have any questions or comments. Again, that's jecraig66 at gmail.com. Thank you. I gotta go someplace where I can get everything I love. Incident with one gig speeds. A home security system. A whole home DVR with thousands of shows on demand. Wait, all those things that you love? I know people right here who can get you all of it. Internet, TV, security, and phone. Get it all with Compori, your friendly neighborhood tech giant. As you set your financial game plan, we'll be with you every play. Relax, you're with Founders. 
Hey, I'm Carter Osterhaus from HGTV, here with some tips on heating your home comfortably and responsibly, starting with your heating system. Even on the coldest days, nothing keeps your home warm and cozy like a high-efficiency, Energy Star qualified natural gas furnace. You can actually feel how warm the air is, and that's because a gas furnace delivers air that's up to 25 degrees warmer than the air from a heat pump, and you'll have warmer air inside and cleaner air outside. Welcome to the Lancaster County School District Career Center, where learning is made relevant. We prepare students from all four of our county high schools for a high wage, high skill, and high demand career. We have something for everyone, whether students plan to go to college, technical school, military, or directly into the workforce, Lancaster County School District's Career Center has a program for you. Students learn all the skill sets associated with a career in welding. This four-course completer program prepares students to earn a national welding certification. Students get to fabricate, build, and repair all types of things made from different types of metal. Students learn about careers in the healthcare field and can earn many certifications, including Certified Clinical Medical Assistant Certification. Students use state-of-the-art equipment to prepare them to care for patients in the real world. Students learn aesthetics, hair and nail care, and work towards earning a South Carolina cosmetology license. The cosmetology lab is set up just like a real shop and students even practice on real clients that come in from the community. Students learn all types of metallurgy, how to mill, grind, and turn metal to make industrial parts. Students learn computer numeric control language so they can prepare to run high-tech machine parts and they can even get to make parts that go into the industry. Students learn all aspects of the culinary field. They can earn Serve Safe and ProStart certifications as they learn about the exciting world of becoming a chef. Students learn all the aspects of a career in firefighting. Students have an opportunity to earn several state and national certifications to prepare them, prepare them to go to work in the field right out of high school. Students learn all aspects of woodworking, cabinet making, and finished construction work. Through project-based learning, students make many things using the tools of the trade to donate or sell to the public. Students learn all about hydraulics, pneumatics, electricity, and electronics. Students work towards being efficient in all aspects of the industrial maintenance field. This program has many educational trainers that allow students to have fun on the machines as they learn important concepts and earn certifications that will lead them to a career in this growing field. Students learn accounting, marketing, computer programming, and computer science concepts and skills. Students have an opportunity to earn certifications to help prepare them for a career in the world of business. Students learn all about careers in law enforcement, emergency telecommunications, and crime scene investigation. This program is centered around project-based learning, and students have the opportunity to earn several certifications that prepare them for a career related to law enforcement and CSI. Students learn all about maintenance and repair of automobiles. They work with industry standard machinery, tools, and equipment to repair cars brought in by customers. Students learn all aspects of automotive body repair and paint. They prep, repair all types of cars and tractors and the skills they learn lead them toward earning an ICAR certification in auto body. Students learn how to frame, build, repair, and do some basic plumbing and electrical work 
using all types of wood and other materials related to the construction industry. Students in this program are constantly building something to donate or sell to the public. This program is a comprehensive program designed to provide students with the core knowledge and skills needed to manage their lives. Project-based instruction is provided throughout the course, focusing on human development, family well-being, relationships, career connections, nutrition, and wellness. Emphasis is placed on helping students acquire knowledge and skills essential to self-care, family care, and guidance of young children. All of the CTE programs and pathways at the Lancaster County School District Career Center are concentrated towards real-world projects that are actually fun to do. Well, we'll go see what happens. <laughs> Uh, about two years ago, uh, I found out about an opportunity uh, involving steam that uh, a gentleman gave us a grant to build a rat rod from uh, at least 10 different vehicles. Uh, we ended up uh, finding a 1998 Ford Ranger pickup and, uh, and we made some modifications to it uh, to have what we have here, which is our Rat Ranger. Uh, one of the first things we changed was the engine. It came with a V6 engine. Of course, that's not enough for a uh, rat rod, so we put a, uh, a 302 out of a 1990 F-150 uh, in it. Uh, had to get a little bit uh, uh, exciting with the exhaust because there was not enough room to run it out the bottom, so the exhaust ends up coming out the sides. Uh, the tailpipes actually came off of a uh, 1988 Mustang LX, uh, so we have part from a uh, LX Mustang there. Uh, bought custom wheels uh, with the uh, Moon-type hubcap. Uh, from old 50s and 60s series uh, hot rods. Uh, coming on down the side of the truck, uh, we have old Chevrolet pickup mirrors. Got to have the big mirrors for a, a wrecker. Uh, on the interior, we have uh, seats out of a 1994 Ford Mustang. The uh, instrument cluster is actually made from a valve cover from a 4.3 liter V6 Chevrolet engine. Uh, we drilled holes in the valve cover and mounted our gauges in. Uh, the shifter in the middle came out of a 1972 Olds Cutlass. It's a dual gate Hurst, his and her shifter. The door panels the students saw uh, made just out of aluminum. Uh, still going for the hot rod vibe. Uh, out back we have uh, externally mounted horns that came off of a uh, Ford minivan. We have a KC spotlight for night operations. Uh, hazard lights on top and of course our flashing beacons in the middle. All the lights work on it. Uh, the uh, boom also works. The uh, boom pole itself was made from drive shafts from two different vehicles. Uh, welded them together to make our boom. Our fuel tank is actually an old metal galvanized gas can. That is the actual fuel tank for the vehicle. Uh, on the back here, our tail lights are from an old school bus. We made our uh, sling here uh, from old drag slicks that we cut apart. Uh, it actually hung the original bumper from the Ranger on the, on the back. Now the bed was totally made by the students. We took the uh, original bed off. Uh, students had to design, cut, weld uh, all of the pieces, the wood they stained. Uh, all of it uh, went together, uh, working real well towards uh, using their imagination. Uh, on the side here we've got just uh, an old wrench that we welded on with valve springs to hold it on just for decoration. Uh, and then of course uh, old school technicians will recognize the old wooden creepers. Uh, so when you add it all up and uh, put it all together, this is our Rat Ranger and uh, it is uh, exactly what STEAM is all about. Science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Because a lot of art went into uh, to building this and uh, imagination as well as, uh, as science and technology.
Overcash. I'm the principal at Kershaw Elementary. My name is Kristen Clay and I am the technology and math coach here at Kershaw Elementary School. Hey, um, I'm Alina Russell. I'm the PE teacher at Kershaw Elementary. I'm here to talk a little bit about the Interactive Blue Playground. It is a new technology. We are actually the first school in the state of South Carolina or North Carolina to have this. Our goal this year was to really bring STEAM into the specials area, so PE and music and art. I can do addition and subtraction problems in math. I can do number recognition. I can do letter recognition. Um, I can do science and social studies, and it's going to have the kids actively engaging in that. One of the reasons we wanted to do that is because we know that kids learn through play. Um, scientists have recently determined that it takes approximately 400 repetitions to create a new synapse in the brain, unless it is done with play, in which it takes between 10 and 20. Business after business agreed that they wanted to be a part of this and to give this to our students here, and it's really been a blessing to see our community come together. But now we're going to integrate math and reading and just every level of skill of academics, it's going to be mixed into PE and they're going to be excited about it and learn and get healthy all at the same time. So we're just really excited about how we can use this from K-5 um, all the way to fifth grade. You, you can do math at the same time, you can learn at the same time you're having fun. Hey Grant, what you doing at the bus depot? I gotta go someplace where I can get everything I love. Internet with one gig speeds. A home security system. A whole home DVR with thousands of shows on demand. Wait, all those things that you love? I know people right here who can get you all of it. Internet, TV, security, and phone. Get it all with Compori, your friendly neighborhood tech giant. As you set your financial game plan, we'll be with you every play. Relax, you're with Founders. Hey, I'm Carter Osterhaus from HGTV, here with some tips on heating your home comfortably and responsibly, starting with your heating system. Even on the coldest days, nothing keeps your home warm and cozy like a high efficiency, Energy Star qualified natural gas furnace. You can actually feel how warm the air is. And that's because a gas furnace delivers air that's up to 25 degrees warmer than the air from a heat pump. And you'll have warmer air inside and cleaner air outside. 